Hello, hello, everybody. Time to talk about Inside Out. I know I'm a little late on this one, but better late than never, right? So let's just get this out of the way right off the bat. Pixar made another amazing movie. I will give you a minute to recover from the shock. Time's up. This is such an amazing and inventive idea, using the personification of human emotions to describe what goes on in a child's mind when they're growing up. It's just brilliant, really. And just the sheer level of detail that went into the emotions and personality traits and memories and dreams and imagination and so on and so forth, just, oh, so good. Now this movie focuses on a little girl named Riley, and actually starts with her being born and shows us a quick montage of her early years. And then when she hits age 12, her father gets a new job and they have to move from Minnesota to San Francisco. An experience that would probably be traumatic enough for an adult, and I imagine even more so for a child. Because here's what San Francisco does. It fools you. It fools you, because they enter the city via the Golden Gate Bridge, this big, beautiful, majestic structure. You can see the San Francisco skyline over here, the Pacific Ocean out that way. Lots of cool little shit like Alcatraz and Fisherman's Wharf and what have you. But then they actually get to the house which is this tiny little box sandwiched in a row of other tiny little boxes on this tiny-ass, smelly street, and going from a Minnesota suburban house with a white picket fence in the backyard and the whole nine yards, and going to the box that is the average San Francisco house, yeah, I would imagine a child would have a hard time adjusting to that, and an adult would have a hard time adjusting to that. And the story focuses on what's going on in Riley's head as she's trying to adjust to her new home. And for most of her childhood, joy has been the dominant emotion. But over time, other emotions came in, sadness, fear, anger, and disgust, and she's had to constantly fight to keep most of Riley's memories happy. But over time, the other emotions start to get in the way, especially sadness, who appears to ruin everything she touches, at least at first glance. Sometimes she will touch a happy memory and it suddenly turns into a sad one, which actually, the way it plays out in the movie, it makes a remarkable amount of sense. There's a moment where she's remembering what her life was like in Minnesota, which was a happy memory at the time, but then when she realizes that part of her life is over, suddenly it's not so happy anymore because she's missing her old home and all their friends and everything. And it works. And at some point, joy and sadness accidentally get sucked out of the little command hub that they have set up in the center of Riley's mind, and they end up inside her long-term memory. And they have to somehow navigate their way back before everything goes horribly, horribly wrong. And meanwhile, fear, disgust, and anger are desperately trying to hold everything together. The key word there being trying. Now, in the past, I've complained about how animated movies nowadays don't use actual voice actors. They just use live actors as voice actors, which seems to do a disservice to people who actually work as voice actors for their career. And this movie is sadly no exception. That being said, casting Louis Black as anger. That's just perfect. I mean, really, who else could they have put in that role? Who else personifies anger like that man? That's just, that's just brilliant casting right there. I can't be mad at that, ironically. And for what it's worth, Amy Poehler, Bill Hader, and Mindy Kaling all did a pretty good job as joy, fear, and disgust, respectively. But I think the one who really stole the show was Phyllis Smith as Sadness. She was so good in this, and really... Probably the most fun, depressing character since Marvin the Paranoid Android. And if you don't know who that is, shame on you. Richard Kind also has a fairly major part in this movie as Bing Bong, who is an imaginary friend from Riley's childhood, and certainly looks like something that would be conjured up by a small child's imagination. He's part elephant, part cat, and part cotton candy because why not? I mean, either this came from a small child's imagination or an adult's acid trip. I'm not really sure which. And given that this is a movie all about growing up, I'm sure I don't have to tell you that he is not in it for the long haul. 
they pretty much spell out exactly what's going to happen to him. Like, oh, what's that place? Oh, that's the cavern of forgotten memories. That's where memories go to die. Gee, I wonder where he's going to end up by the end of this movie. He's going to end up down in that hole, isn't he? And it's going to be sad, isn't it? Yeah. Riley is voiced by Caitlin Diaz, who I've never heard of before this movie, and for good reason. I checked her IMDb profile, and she hasn't done much before this movie, but I thought she did a fantastic job. There are also a lot of neat little cameos in this movie. Dave Goles and Frank Oz, two legendary Muppet performers, are both in this, playing characters named Dave and Frank, but they're reversed. So Dave is playing Frank, and Frank is playing Dave. I thought that was kind of clever. Flea also has a small part in this movie. Yes, that flea, Red Hot Chili Peppers, that guy. I don't know why, but he's in there. And of course, John Ratzenberger has a small part in this, because if Pixar does a movie without Ratzenberger, the world will stop spinning on its axis. No, really, it's true. It's science. Now, as far as the animation goes, what do you want me to say? It's Pixar. Of course, it looks amazing. From Pixar, you expect near perfection at this point, and that's pretty much what you get. They got the look of San Francisco pretty much dead on, which makes sense. Their studios are in the area. If they didn't get it right, I would be very confused. Everything inside Riley's head is all bright and colorful, especially the memories, which are represented by these little glowing balls that are organized by color, depending on what emotion they're associated with. And as the movie goes on, sometimes they change color, like from happy to sad and back again. And sometimes they get to the point where they have multiple colors, because as you get older, that stuff gets more complex. It's just amazing how much creativity went into this and how out there and bizarre it is, and yet somehow it makes perfect sense. And the emotions themselves look like they're actually made out of little tiny bubbles, which kind of makes sense for joy, but for the other emotions, I don't know. I'm not really sure why they went with that. I read somewhere that after they did the design for Joy, John Lasseter looked at it and said, you know what? That looks perfect. Let's do it for all five of them. Which made them nearly have a heart attack, because I guess the amount of processing power it takes to animate that character was so intense, and they're like, oh no, we're gonna break our server farm with this. <laughs> but obviously they didn't break it, they found a way. And the interior design of Riley's mind, from the islands that represent all the various personality traits, and the long-term memory storage, and the abyss of forgotten memories, the little movie studio that represents the dreams and everything, it's just, everything looks amazing! The story is fantastic. It was supposedly based on uh, director Pete Docter's own experiences as a child, and it's something that I think a lot of kids, and adults for that matter, can relate to. It's got a pretty good balance of comedy and drama and, of course, the feels. Oh, the feels. The feels are strong with this one. And there are a few jokes in there that are really just for the adults. Not that they're obscene or anything, it's just stuff that's probably going to go over most kids' heads. There's a scene early on where Fear is afraid that they're going to somehow run into a bear in San Francisco, to which Disgust says, ah, There are no bears in San Francisco. Relax. And then Anger says, well, we passed by that one really hairy guy. He kind of looked like a bear. Bear, hairy guy, San Francisco, you get it. If I had to come up with a main gripe for this movie, which is hard to do, oh man, but if I had to pick something, I would have liked to see a little more of what was going on inside the heads of other people and not just Riley. I know Riley's the focus of the story, so most of the action is going to take place in her head. That's fine, but little bits and pieces of other people's heads would have gone a long way, I thought. And we get some of that. Like, there's that one scene that I'm sure a lot of you have seen in that one trailer where they're all sitting down to dinner and we get looks inside mom and dad's head. Inside Dad said, well, that was almost a disaster. Go back to Mom said, well, that was a disaster. You know that scene. But until the very end of the movie, that's really it. And after that, there's some stuff that's just kind of tacked on at the end just to play over the ending credits. Like, we see inside a bus driver's head and all five of his emotions are anger, <laughs> which, which was pretty funny. There's a moment where we see inside some animals' heads as well. We go inside a dog's head, and pretty much the only thing that's going on in there is... That man has food. We should follow the man with the food. Maybe he will give us the food. 
Obviously, Pixar's understanding of animals has not waned at all. But yeah, I would like to have seen a little more of that, but maybe they're just saving some stuff for the sequel. And if they do make a sequel to this movie, God, there are a million different directions they could go. They don't even have to focus on what happens to Riley. They could create a completely different character. Just the possibilities for this are endless. And my final verdict, if you haven't already figured it out, yes, this is worth seeing at any price. Go do so if you have not seen it already. Now, as far as the 3D surcharge, I would say that's optional. I did see it in 3D. The 3D looks fine. I mean, most animated movies do look good in 3D nowadays, but I don't think it's necessarily required. This would still look absolutely gorgeous in 2D. And that's it for now. Next time I talk to you, I will probably be talking about Terminator Genesis and... Ooh, I'm not really looking forward to that one. I hope I'm wrong. I really do, but... I don't think I will be, but we'll worry about that when we come to it. So until then, take care.